The scripture this morning is taken from the book of John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. You'll find it also in your bulletin. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the word of the Lord. And we have been looking at uh, how the Bible is to be used, how it's useful in our lives. We took a two-week break. Before that, we looked at the Old Testament. Now that we're back, we're switching to the New Testament. I'm just going to be speaking kind of from a bird's eye view of the New Testament, particularly one aspect of the New Testament, still looking at the Bible as a whole um, today. But um, uh, let's kind of get started uh, with, with some practical stuff. I have a lot of people who come and ask me, how, how do I read my Bible? I haven't really read it a lot on my own. I have a Bible or have one on my phone, but I don't really know how to get started with it so that I'm, I'm reading it more regularly. Well, here are some things that I recommend, just some practical tips on how to get the most out of reading the Bible. The first thing that I recommend, and I recommend this to everybody who's a Christian, that at least one time in your life, you read the Bible cover to cover. In other words, you begin with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and you just keep on going. You just power through the rest of the Bible until you hit the last verse of Revelation and it switch over, switches over to the maps. I mean, you can stop there uh, that, and just keep going cover to cover, beginning to end. The reason I suggest that you at least do this once is because I think it's so valuable to get the sense of the whole story. Of the Bible, and really, the only way you can do that is if you read the Bible uh, all the way through, cover to cover. It really gives you a sense of how the themes of the Bible uh, sort of weave their way all the way through, and how there is a story, there is an arc that goes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So that's the first thing I suggest. Second thing, I really do suggest that you bring your Bible to worship with you. This is a little risky um, because sometimes it gives the impression if everybody's opened up their Bibles during the sermon that we're this, you know, big Bible-believing church and it almost feels like we're showing off a little bit and it can be intimidating sometimes to others and that's really not what we're doing. The reason that I encourage you to bring your Bibles to worship with you is because the task of interpreting the scripture is not my task alone. My job is just to be a help and a guide. It really is the task of the whole church to interpret the scriptures together. And we can't really do that if we're not looking at the same thing and you are having God speak to you maybe even in a different way than God spoke to me. And that just makes the whole experience richer, I think. That's an important thing to do. So bring your Bible with you to worship or bring it on your phone or on your tablet. And then third, I recommend to every single Christian that they at least get started or that they are maintaining Uh, a way that they are using the Bible outside of Sunday morning and outside of worship and on their own. And, and And that they're reading the Bible prayerfully. Now, some people uh, use the term devotionally for what I'm talking about. And I am talking about that, but often what people will do then is they will buy a devotional book or a devotional guide that takes you through each day, or they get it online, or there's a booklet or something like that. And and those are valuable, but the problem with those um, sometimes is that 
Christians start letting other people speak for the Bible rather than come to the Bible themselves and have that, that conversation with God through Scripture. So I encourage you to just try approaching Scripture on your own. Find a, a, a website or a book that gives you a verse for the day, and then you interact with that verse and interact with what God's saying. Here's a technique that has been taught to me, which has made a big difference for me in terms of my prayerful reading. And um, it's called dwelling in the word. And the fancy Latin name is Lectio Divina. But basically, it's repetitious reading. And the way I was taught is you read a passage through completely twice. Maybe even read it out loud. Or read it, you know, all the way through. And what you're looking for as you read it the first time through is a word or a phrase that kind of leaps off the page, where you really stop on that word or phrase. And you ask God the question, why is that particular word really um, sticking out of the verse for me? So then you read the passage all the way through again, and this time you're asking yourself the question, God, what are you trying to to tell me today? What are you communicating to me through this word? And you meditate on that question for a few minutes. So try that as, I think, a very effective, intentional way of uh, reading the scriptures prayerfully and, and see how that um, begins to unlock that uh, reading of the Bible outside of Sunday morning. But all this presupposes that you believe that the Bible is true. I mean, you wouldn't invest this amount of time and energy in reading, studying, praying through the Bible if you didn't feel like the words of the Bible were worth spending time on and worth reading and listening to because they were trustworthy, that you could base your life on these words. The question is, is the Bible true? Well, Jesus seemed to think so. If we look at our verse again that Kay read for us, this is in John chapter 8. If you're looking with me, I'm looking at verses 31 and 32. Look at what Jesus says. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples because you will know the truth. If you hold to my teaching, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So he closely aligns truth with the teaching of God that he is giving, right? Now, what's interesting, though, is that perceptions of this Bible and its truth are changing uh, right around us in our midst. Uh, Gallup organization, have you heard of them? They, they are, do a great job of, of polls, but one thing they're especially good at is getting a read from time to time on the religious landscape in the United States. So they, just this, this year, they repeated a poll that they have given through the years, asking Americans whether they believe that the Bible is A, God's inspired word, or B, a book that's written by humans. And it has myths and fables and legends and teachings and morals that uh, are worth reading, for sure, but it's not God's own utterance. It is, it's, it's written by humans. So it asks that question, and this year, 2022, 20% of the respondents said that they believed that this was the inspired word of God. Now that's, that's down. Uh, 2017 is the last time that they did this poll, and it was 24% then, but that's half of what it was in 1984. So it's been dropping like a rock 
in terms of the number of people that believe this is a divinely inspired word of God. That's interesting because the, um, the evangelicals and conservative Christians that purportedly make this a big deal, it must be affecting them to get a number that low. So this is across the board. On the other hand, the number of people who answered B, that the Bible is written by humans, collection of fables and myths and legends, that has grown to 29%, which is the high point for that number. What's interesting about these two numbers together is this is the first time that the number of people who don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God outnumber the people who do. This is the first time in documented U.S. history that, that the polling for the Bible has been this low. Interesting. How about you? What do you think about the Bible? Do you believe that the Bible is true because... It is God's word for you. It is inspired by God. It is God's word for you. I think part of the problem, frankly, has been it's, it's the fault of Christians. It's the fault of the church. We have put so much effort and time and resources into proving the truth of the Bible and talking and arguing about the truth of the Bible without really defining what truth is. What is truth? Truth is a complicated thing. Have you noticed that? It hits on a lot of different levels. And it means a lot of different things. Um, I think that's why as, as parents of young children, we start working on truth really quickly. It's like one of the first things that we start talking to our kids about is the importance of telling the truth and being honest with yourself and with others because it takes a lifetime uh, to really follow the path of truth. you got to start early, and folks who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, would you agree with me that you got to keep working on truth in your 60s, 70s, and 80s and, and beyond? Um, Part of that is because we as humans are terrible at truth. It does not come naturally to us as humans. I mean, we believe in it, and we value it, and we certainly expect other people to value the truth, but the problem is that we are, are so enthralled by pride and greed, and fear, and selfishness that we always are tempted to leave truth, put truth aside if it doesn't serve our ends. Little white lies, right? Little self-deceptions that we start to harbor, telling something people something that isn't necessarily the truth so they'll like us better or do what we want them to do. We are very susceptible to that. We are not good at truth, which is another reason we need to work on it and we need to understand what it is. Truth has to be something more than what we do. It has to become a part of who we are. And that takes a lifetime to achieve and to maintain. The cool thing about the Bible is it acknowledges the complexity of truth. And it, and it presents the truth of the Bible and the truth of God in a holistic way. There are three main definitions of truth that we as humans have talked about in our history. Um, and here's some big words that you can impress your friends with. You know, oh, well, I believe ontologically, and everybody's going, wow, ontologically, pretty nice. Ontological truth, moral truth, and another big word, cognitive truth. The Bible covers all of these aspects of truth. Cognitive truth, or sorry, ontological truth, ontology is the study of being, of essential being, of existence, in other words. So when we talk about ontological truth, we talk about truth that is a, 
has become a part of who you are. It's not just what you do, it's, it's what you're about. You have incorporated into your very being, and the Bible certainly says that this is true of God, that God's truth is because God is truth. God's being is truth. And then that flows into moral truth, which we're all very familiar with. That's telling the truth. That's doing truthful things. It's making decisions for truth instead of falsehood. That's moral truth. And we believe that God has been truthful, has stuck with the truth, and everything that God has said, everything that God says is true, and everything that God does reinforces that truth, but most of us kind of keep ourselves to cognitive truth, which is knowing the truth, understanding the truth, being taught the truth. We're very big on that, and that's important, and God certainly knows the truth better than any of us do. God is perfect in his knowledge of the truth, but as humans, if we keep it on the mind level and don't let it sink into our heart and don't let it sink into our soul and our spirit, then we'll always be tempted to abandon it. The task of humanity is to embrace holistic truth into our very being. And the Bible, that's its approach. We know this because of the other thing I want to tell you about the Bible's truth. This is where the New Testament kind of comes in. is because we believe that the truth of the Bible isn't confined to this book. The truth of the Bible isn't about a book, it's about a person who is described in this book. In fact, the way we get to know who that person is, is by reading this book. It is the central figure of the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Do you have any idea who I'm talking about? No, it's Craig Sumi. You should know that. No. And it's not you either, is it? It is Jesus. Truth is a person. Truth is a person. And, and not only do we say that Jesus is true, we, we say that he is true because of all of the three things that we talked about. Ontologically, morally, cognitively, Jesus checks all those boxes. And one of the things that's, that's interesting about that, if you're a Christian and you're sort of interested in all the other religions of the world, this is a unique position that Christianity takes about its central figure, that, that not only uh, is, is, is Jesus, what Jesus says is trustworthy, what Jesus does is trustworthy. Jesus is the truth. Jesus personifies truth. And that's because Jesus was a human, but Jesus was also God. And so part of the package that comes with God in Jesus is God's own essence of truth, ontological truth, which flows in everything that Jesus does and says, and so if we get to know Jesus, then we will come to know the truth. Just take a look at these verses. This, these verses talk about how the Bible, the Word of God, is true. This first one comes from Psalm, the, the book of Psalms 119. The sum, this is somebody praying to God, the sum of your Word, God, is truth. And Every one of your righteous rules endures forever. So not only is it true now, it's, it's true all the time. And then take a look at the verse from Proverbs there. Every word of God proves true. Proves true. When, when submitted to the test, every word of God comes out on the truth side. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. But then, notice when we switch over to the New Testament, right away in the prologue of John's gospel, we read these words. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. So wait a minute, the word there is not talking about the Bible. 
We don't call the Bible the he. Who's the he in this verse? Anybody? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. The, the word Jesus, the name Jesus, is substituted for this Greek word logos, which means the message, the utterance, the word. And the word became flesh in Jesus and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. So when Jesus says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, he's not saying because you, you need to trust in God. He's not saying it's because you need to be truth-telling. That's not his message. His message isn't to get all these doctrines of the faith straight so that you'll know the truth that way. He says, no, know me. That's all you need to do. Know me. Get to know who I am. Follow me. Become my disciple, and if you do, you will come to know the truth, and that truth will have the power to set you free. Jesus says, if the Son gives you freedom, then you are free indeed. And the word there for freedom in the Greek, aletheos, means Literally, unchained. You, you are not a slave to anything or to anyone if you have placed your trust in the truth of God in Jesus. So have you done that? How do you do that? Well, just to close, a couple of, of ideas for you to look at and maybe start implementing in your life. When you do read the scriptures, look for Jesus. He is always there. Every single verse in the Bible is about one of two things. It's either about God and God's love or God's glory or God's holiness or all those things combined or it's about humans and their struggle with the truth and their need for God's truth to set them free. Every single verse is about one of those two things. And Jesus, if you'll pardon the expression, is the crux of those two things. God's love and our need for that love. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the connecting point for all of those things. And so you can read any verse in Scripture, and the best thing you can do is look for Jesus in that verse. I'll give you an example. Our kids were here this week for music camp. Bonnie, great job. It was awesome. And uh, they did the, um, their performance was the story of Jonah, right? Okay. So the story of Jonah, do you know the story of Jonah? Okay, so, so Jonah is a prophet, in the Old Testament, who was sent by God, called by God to go to the city of Nineveh and give them a warning um, about God's judgment that would come upon them if they continue on the path that they are on. Well, we know, you may know, that Jonah resisted that. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He went the opposite direction, and so that's when we get the big fish, swallows him up, takes him back to the shore, spits him out on the shore, and he's going, okay, God, I'll go to Nineveh. So he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches. He gives the prophecy, but then something amazing happens. Everybody in Nineveh believes him, and they place their, their trust in God. And Jonah, instead of being happy about this, he's hacked off. He was there. He was ready for some fire and some brimstone. He was ready. He was there to see God bring down the hammer on those Ninevites. And God said to Jonah, that's not what I'm about. I'm about forgiveness. So one, Nineveh was, not, was a foreign city. It was not where Jonah's people were from. So he had to go across those boundaries to a different place in order to deliver some good news. Are you getting any Jesus in this? And then instead of bringing God's wrath 
in God's judgment, he was there to proclaim God's love and God's forgiveness for those who repent. Are you getting any Jesus in the story of Jonah? And you're going to find that wherever you go. And the second thing that I think is so great about believing in the truth of Scripture is now you have a built-in guaranteed protection against falsehood. You go to school and you hear all these things from your friends and from the teachers. Uh, You get online. And you're reading blogs and articles and newspapers and magazines. And you go on to social media and everybody's trying to tell everybody what the truth is, right? You are bombarded with all these messages. You, you barely switch it off when you go to sleep. So in all your waking hours, you're getting bombarded by messages about what's true and what's not. And it can be overwhelming. It can be confusing. But Christians... If you believe in the truth of the Bible, then you know where to go. You can compare anything that you're hearing in the world with the Bible's truth, particularly the truth that is personified in Jesus. And if it's not about grace, then you know it's falsehood. If it's not about redemption and deliverance, forgiveness, if it's not about faithfulness, if it's not about humility, then you know you don't have to give it too much attention. It's about somebody who's playing God and not God because God's very clear in his word who he's about. He backs it up with what he does and what he says. And he makes it what we can know. So gracious God, I pray as we encounter the Bible, as we read the words in the Bible, that you would convict us of its truth. You would convince us of its truth. Because what it says is all about your love for us, your unconditional gracious love. What it's about is your desire to bring restoration and reconciliation and transformation into creation which has been broken by sin and evil. These are the things that we long for. These are the things we want to hear a message about. And that is exactly what you're trying to tell us. It is personified in Jesus himself who came to earth to reveal it to us. And backed it up with the cross and the empty tomb. Increase our faith in the truth of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.